Typically, when you think about all the hall mods in Factorio, you probably think of mods like Crastorio 2 or Pyanodons, which change recipes. Warptorio 2 is an overhaul mod, but it uses all vanilla recipes and mostly vanilla buildings. What it overhauls is the Factorio formula. For those who don't know, Warptorio 2 is a mod where you are periodically teleported to a new planet and lose everything you built on the surface of the previous one. The only thing you bring with you is what's built on the warp platform, which you can see on the left here. And I mean everything. If you aren't stood on it when it leaves, it will go without you, leaving nothing but a hole in the ground and a lot of angry biters. Even evolution is reset when you warp. So far, this might seem quite easy if it wasn't for one feature of the warp platform. It outputs a shit ton of pollution. That was with no buildings placed down, and this only increases as time goes on. Even with only two miners placed down, they come for me. I realise quickly that with so much pollution reaching the nests already, I can't produce enough ammo to keep fending them off. My immediate answer is to mine it myself. Here's a quick look at the absolute volume of technologies added by Waptario. A lot of them are upgrades for the platform itself, making it bigger and such. However, some of them are personal buffs such as mining productivity or extra inventory space. Here I'm getting ready to leave, as the hand mining is driving me insane. However, it takes 30 seconds for the warp drive to charge. In this time, a big group of biters approach, so I need to quickly get rid of my furnaces and be ready to fight them. As you can see, they get a little confused in the middle here, as the polluting buildings that came to attack are gone. Even more come to join the fray. And with no ammo left, I'm reduced to hitting them with my pickaxe. Finally, we warp to a new planet and I get straight to work smelting things. The best time to get things done is right after you warp, as the pollution hasn't had time to reach the biter nests yet. Straight away, I set up a little power plant so I can do some research. I begin straight away with automation research, as there's nothing worse in Factorio than handcrafting. After only 4 minutes on this planet, the first attack comes. You might have noticed me take the ammo out of my gun, this is to save it for bigger waves which may soon come. Here, I'm on my phone waiting for research to finish. Sensing my distraction, the biters make the most of it. What's not seen in the video is me dropping my phone on my keyboard when I hear the biter noises. Perhaps this is a punishment for my lack of productivity. Soon though, gun turret research finishes so I can get back to gathering resources. I don't even have enough copper to spare for repair kits. And so begins a key part of early Warptario. I am like a shepherd, and these burner mining drills are my sheep. I must move them around from our patch to our patch, and keep a keen eye on them, lest predators pick them off. In all seriousness, if I take my eyes off these for a second, biters will come and blow them up. As they always say, a watched miner never explodes. Here are the aforementioned mining productivity upgrades. They're essential in this mod, as you're always moving your miners around. The productivity makes up for the downtime and extra. I decide we have enough of these resources, so it's time to move the flock. We can never have enough iron in this mod, as the attacks quickly become ridiculously large. Even later into the game, over half of our iron production will go into ammo. Here's the mod list really quick for anyone curious. Segway? What's a segway? My time spent mining iron was mostly uneventful, but I'm running low on fuel so I need to move back over to the coal patch. While I'm pottering around gathering coal, probably the biggest attack we've seen so far arrives. I pull up the miners as fast as I can, which isn't very fast. Because of this, we take one casualty. I decide to move on, it's not safe for us here anymore. The 
For reasons I'm not entirely sure about, not every planet seems to be affected by alien biomes. For this one certainly has been, the last one wasn't. With plenty of coal, we can get some serious mining underwear. The amount of pollution that the platform produces completely dwarfs anything we can make. Because of this, there's no reason to build small, as the bite of attacks will be about the same size either way. Even distribution really is a must have for this mod. I built some gun turrets while I was on the last planet, so I know I'm going to need to sit and babysit these miners. So while the miners work, I go and mine some rocks to get more coal. The Alien Biomes mod adds a massive amount of rocks, but balances this by making each one of them give less stone and coal. Really this just makes it an even better waste of time while I wait for resources to accumulate. Eventually, I decide I have enough iron, so I deconstruct the mining setup. I set it back up on some copper, since I'm probably going to need a lot of it for science. Not a massive mount however, so after a few minutes I soon take it apart again. It's time to put those resources to use, so I start to build a science setup. Now that I have a means to defend myself, I have a new goal. The transience of these tiny bases is starting to sap away at me. I need something permanent, something I don't need to tear up every 20 minutes. So I start researching upgrades to my warp platform, hoping that at some point I can move some portion of my base onto it. The biters, however, have different ideas. With an unupgraded warp platform, you only get about 20 minutes before the game forces you to warp. So even though I'm quite comfortable and can probably stay here a bit longer, I'm forced to leave. I do try to research for as long as feasibly possible though. You can see the first upgrade to the warp platform here, as you can see it's quite a bit bigger. The hazarded out areas are where buildings will go later when we research them. Also, I feel like Warp Tario 2 can have a strange interaction with alien biomes sometimes, as this planet seems to be completely bare. To begin with, I continue to research. I eventually decided to save to leave the research setup on its own, so I go to set up some mining. While I'm there, an upgrade for the warp drive finishes. The most notable fact that this has is that it lets me stay there for extra 10 minutes on any given planet before I'm automatically warped. The next research that finishes is something called the Warp Factory Floor. You can see it here, a weird building on the platform. It's essentially an extra floor beneath the platform, which I can build on and comes with us when we warp. As you can see from the corpses in the bottom right, attacks have begun. While watching my miners, I hear the destruction noise and fear the worst. However, as it turns out, a group of biters had valiantly banded together to destroy a chest full of stone. How will I ever recover from this? Our next research is a warp platform upgrade, seen here. The attacks are becoming quite large now, even managing to get a couple hits on our buildings. At this point, we've been here so long that biter evolution is approaching 30%. This means that medium biters and small spitters are mixed into the attacks. Even more pressingly, despite the recent upgrade to the warp drive, the warp platform is going to automatically warp in 2 minutes, so we need to get ready and skedaddle. Disappointingly, this one seems to also be unaffected by alien biomes. This planet is a rare one. It's an island, completely devoid of any biters, but also completely lacking resources. The best I can really do is just research until my resources run out. I'll skip that, because it's quite boring. All you need to know is that I researched some physical projectile damage and some mining productivity. You can tell when the next planet's going to be an alien biomes one, because it pauses like this to generate it. And oh boy is this a good one, completely volcanic, I love this mod. I mean just look at the surface here, weird greens and blues, there's just nothing like this in vanilla. The attacks start quite early this time, with only 3 minutes on the planet. Once I decide I have enough coal, I move on to mining resources again. I'm quite fortunate that it's generated this way, 
as I can defend both mines with the same set of turrets. I meet this attack halfway to try and weaken it a bit. It's important to remember however that turrets are the most efficient for killing biters. This is because any damage upgrades you research, they get twice. So the physical damage upgrade we researched earlier not only gave an upgrade to the bullet's damage, but also the turret damage. With some resources gathered, I get red science back on the menu. And finally research green science. A lot of the most important warp upgrades are found in the green science era, which we'll see some of later in the episode. These biters seem to get quite confused by that rock. The pile of bodies around these mines are getting quite large. I need to be careful to make sure I'm not using too much iron. Here's a look at the newly upgraded factory for all. I'm getting ready to move all of my science production and consumption down here. It's completely safe from biters down here, so the only things I need to protect are what I leave on the surface, which at this point is basically just mining and power production. While I wait for the platform to warp, I set up the surface portion of my base. This is our first big move towards something more permanent. This is what I end up with. The pipes as walls serve two purposes. While its purpose is obviously for defence, it also works as a water buffer for the boiler if the water pipes are disconnected. This is really convenient as it means I can connect the water pipes from any direction. On the factory floor, I'm getting ready to make some green science. But on the surface, the biters are really starting to react to my presence. Strictly speaking, most planets are around the same difficulty in Warptoria. However, factors to do with the terrain generation can affect how large and how frequent attacks are. This appears to be one of those planets where the terrain generation has made it a bit harder. This culminates in probably the biggest attack we've seen so far. Those numbers are insane. I need to distract them, just so they don't tear through our walls. For obvious reasons, I'm choosing to leave now. Hopefully, the next planet will be a bit more forgiving. Another non-alien biomes planet. You can tell which ones are alien biomes planets because they have shallow water, which is weird white water that you can walk on. Here you can see me connecting my base to water. I will often forget to do this later. We start with the usual business of mining. Don't worry, it's not going to be this tedious forever. This appears to be a slightly easier planet than the last one as it's taken over 5 minutes for the first attackers to arrive. Once they start coming though, it can only get worse from there. It isn't long however before these attacks start getting quite large again. Maybe this planet wasn't so much easier after all. The piles of bodies are getting ridiculous now. It's time to leave again already. I'm inside when we warp this time. Yet another barren planet. Also, I forget to plug in my water before I leave the base here. By the time I realise, I'm almost 3 minutes into this planet. But thanks to the water buffer, power's still running. The biters aren't usually drawn towards these small mining outposts. However, if it happens to be in between a nest and the warp platform, it can be subject to a barrage of massive attacks. Here, you can see a new staircase has appeared on the factory floor. We'll have a look down there later. Again, I'm busy working underground when the platform warps. The surface is yet again barren. Also, I forgot to bring in my water pipes before I warped. This is going to be a continuous problem. However, there is an upgrade locked behind Blue Science which adds a water source inside the warp platform. As inconvenient as they are, there's a real satisfying look to burn a mine in setups. Clearly, the biters don't agree. This setup's almost getting more attacks than my actual base. We're using a lot of ammo, so I decide to leave while we still can. I know I'm jumping around a lot, but there is very little downside to warping. While the downsides to staying are obvious. We've landed on a peaceful planet again, so it's a perfect time to get some work done on the base. To begin with, there's a new arm on the left side of the harvester floor. This is a harvester platform, which we'll see more of when I actually end up on the planet with resources. The next floor down is the boiler floor. This is where our power production is going to go. At the moment, we're pumping water from the surface down here. However, eventually, this is where that interior water source I was talking about later will be located. Next, it's time to renovate the factory floor. To begin with, we're placing down furnace stacks. This is our first big step towards moving away from burner mining setups. Iron we produce will be automatically turned into bullets which can be delivered to the gun turrets on the surface. 
For anyone who doesn't know, those chests next to the elevators share their inventory with the chest on the other side of the elevator. That means if I put bullets into that chest, they'll appear in the chest on the surface. The final thing to renovate is the surface portion of the base. There's a lot of platform here, and we aren't really using it. Firstly, I expand the wall right out to the edge of the platform. Then of course, we need turrets. Also, as you can see, this circular ammo belt is fed by the factory below. This will make it very easy to top this place up on ammo. Also, here's a quick look at the power setup belt on the boiler floor. Finally, it's time to leave with an entirely different base to what we had when we arrived. Here's a look at the harvester platforms I was talking about. It's a bit bare. That's better. To move these, I just have to pick up the lab in the middle, and it picks up all the miners and the turrets with it. When I put it down on the other side, it'll brace them down too. The lab in the middle also works as an elevator, so I can walk straight into the harvester floor. We eventually end up with two of these harvester platforms. The split, as you can see in the background here, sort what comes in from the harvesters. Stone is taken away just to be put in a chest, coal goes up to a power plant or down to few other furnaces, and iron and copper are put in as input for the furnaces. Here's me picking up the platform. I can't seem to find anything but coal however, so we'll need to go to a new planet to get some use out of them. Here's me putting the platform back down. After three and a half hours, our first automated smelting stack. Most of this is going to ammo, but anything that's left over is going to go to those buffer chests at the end. Now that we've finished that massive undertaking, it's time to get back to what really matters, science. The long, narrow corridors of the harvester floor are perfect for hand-fed setups. Slowly, our ammo reserves are growing. Once I've decided I have enough iron, I move it over to a copper patch. Eventually, we'll have two harvester platforms, which will make balancing resources a bit easier. Until then, however, this is all still not as automatic as I'd like. We really don't need a massive amount of copper, however, the more I get now, the longer it'll be before I need to mine it again. Also, the extra mining productivity upgrades are really noticeable now. Our 7 miners with mining productivity of 50% produce the same amount as 10.5 miners with 0% productivity. For the first time in this entire playthrough, I feel like our base is stabilised. Despite this, we don't want to waste too much iron, so we move on. Straight away I got a place down my harvester. The best place to put them is far away from the base, so the only attacks they get is the ones caused by their own pollution. However, without a car, getting that far away is a waste of time. So for now, the best I can do is keep the turrets well stocked. It can get quite boring waiting around though. For this reason, I'm going to put down a burner mining setup, so at least feeding it can give me something to do. I'd like to reiterate that even distribution is an absolute must for this mod. You might ask what it is we're waiting for. Our problem is that to automate research we need more space, but to get more space we need to research. So we're stuck handcrafting in these cramped setups. This is a lovely part of the game, affectionately called Hand Feeding Hell. I got to check on our harvester and find it surrounded by this absolute massacre. It's clearly right between some nests and the warp platform. However, I really need the iron, I don't want to go find more, so I'm going to leave it here. A little restock should suffice. Not like it really matters, because soon afterwards I decide to leave. You can see on the lake the effect that the pollution from the platform has. We arrive on yet another peaceful planet. However, since it has no resources and our buffer is almost empty, there's no point staying here, so we leave. Again to burn away the time, I set up a little burner mining setup. I'm about to get another big research in the works. You might think our harvester floor looks a bit lopsided with just one arm. And you'd be right, so I'm going to research the other one now. 
This is going to double our resource acquisition rate, as well as allowing us to harvest two resources at the same time. The burner mining is great and all, but it's really just more things to defend. Plus, once this second harvest has finished researching, we'll have more resources than we'll know what to do with. Easily the most annoying part about building these things is that you can't place the drills until it's on an R patch. I wish this was just a setting you could turn off. Maybe I want to place useless drills. I'm going to go split it across this coal and copper patch. We don't need lots of either, so it just makes sense to do both at the same time. For such a small platform, I think 7 drills is the most you can fit on it, however I'd love to be proven wrong. Of course, this isn't the biggest that the platforms get, and we can upgrade them in time. The most satisfying part of building in Factorio is the long atmospheric shots at the end of everything working. It's quite tranquil down here, unlike on the surface. And after enough waiting and long atmospheric shots, we get to where we are now, with a self-sufficient base at the precipice of the next part of the game. We've made a base that survives, but next we need to make one that thrives, where the science goes to the lab by belt, not by hand, and where the walls are automatically fixed, and where we measure production science per second, not seconds per science. But all that will have to wait until next time. We pick up basically right where we left off. We're still waiting on a lot of research before we can seriously progress our base, so we're just bouncing around until we can get to that point. We have some improvements we can make while things research, however. As these comments pointed out, my harvester designs weren't exactly efficient. Thank you guys. What I wasn't understanding was that only one tile of the mine needs to actually be on the platform for it to come with when I move it. This means I wasn't fitting nearly as many miners on the platform as I could have otherwise. So keep in mind, to begin with I could fit 7 on the platform. And now with just a little shuffling, I have this new design. It fits a whole 11 miners on the platform. There's even space for a 12th on the right there, however eventually there's going to be a warp pipe there, so it won't be there forever. If you look now, I forgot to connect one of the belts. I set up the same thing with the other platform. Now we'll be able to have potentially 24 miners going at the same time. We quite literally may not be able to use all this new input. For this reason, I build buffers for incoming materials from the mines. It's not much, but hopefully it'll keep production going while we're between planets. I'm going to move my labs over to the right side now, to free up the left wing for even more hand feeding. I promise that by the end of this episode we'll have actual automated setups, we just need more space first. This is why those buffer chests are so important. We're bringing in so many resources that the elevator chests can't pull them through fast enough. If it wasn't for the buffers, would have been gathering no resources all this time. The other thing that doesn't help is how awful an idea it is to mix the resources going through these chests. If it isn't all immediately being removed from the chest on the other side, it just ends up pulling one of the resources. The best answer to this is just more consumption, but we're limited until we have better furnaces. Watch this satisfying time lapse become immensely unsatisfying as copper backs up. After a lot of waiting and hand feeding, we reach a big breakthrough. We can fit a lot more machines here now, but we can do even better than this. We're using so many resources, when I reach a peaceful one we have nothing to do, so I leave basically straight away. It always feels like such a prize, ending up on an alien biomes planet. With my newly built car, I'm ready to set off across the surface. Harvester platforms are best placed far away from my base. This is because, without the pollution from the platform, they should get very few attacks. This wasn't as much of a problem before. But as we start to spend more time on planets, the bite attacks will only get bigger, and the more space we need to use for defences on these things, the less space we have for miners. This part of the game has been a lot of waiting, but as soon as we get these researchers we're waiting for, the whole game opens up. I definitely could, and should, be playing a lot more actively, but the idea of pulling everything up every 20 minutes just makes me want to cry. The bottom doesn't affect me, I just get a bit dangerous to make up for it. If you'd believe it, this research is the biggest upgrade we could get at the moment, for reasons you'll see shortly. Naturally, I'm messing around elsewhere when the next factory floor upgrade finishes, 
but here's the outcome. I forgot to connect the water when we arrived on this planet, so the power runs out. This could be catastrophic if I didn't realise, as those turrets only hold 10 ammo. Placing down my harvester platforms, I accidentally create this monstrosity. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you Electric Miner MK 1.5, brought to you by Warped Audio 2. Anyway, it's time to see what that research I was talking about earlier does. Ta-da! Now that's a lot of space. And we get three more of those. This is how we're going to solve our space problem. I mean, these things practically exist for furnace stacks. I'm too busy dancing around the furnaces picking up iron for this one, but you can see it on the minimap. Here's the final result. Now that is a lot of space. These bridges are only 7 tiles wide however, and furnace stacks are 9 tiles wide, so I need to research this bridge widening upgrade before I can start building properly. Here it comes. Perfect. This will perfectly fit some furnace stacks. I'm planning it from the beginning to be able to support a full red belt of resources. That's 24 steel furnaces on either side. We didn't even have 24 furnaces on the entire factory floor at the start of this episode. Doing this without bots is absolute hell. Some sort of bot start should be a damn dependency with this mod. The first thing we build is the most important thing, ammo. Buffers are absolutely essential in this mod, so I'm making sure to incorporate them as much as possible. Here I'm building a quite satisfying buffer for iron, copper and coal. These are important if we want to make the most out of the peaceful planets we occasionally encounter. And with that, we can finally plug in the new setup and get some real production started. It's crazy how this mod warps the perspective of the game. What would be a pre-starter base in a normal game has carried us up to the 8 hour mark. Although, that could just be a consequence of how slow I am. You know, having 800 hours in something doesn't necessarily mean you're good at it. And the size and volume of these attacks is insane. Usually by the time we get to this level of pollution in vanilla, the biters have evolved far beyond this. It's strange seeing such big attacks from such little biters. Now it's time for the copper stack. Again all by hand because I was foolish enough to not install any early bots mods. I might have to start calling it Carpal Tunnel Tario. I snake the copper on to meet up with the iron. It's taken a whole 8 hours, but I'm starting to sense a fully automated factory farming. Even then however, it's never truly automated, because I still need to move the harvesters around every time we warp. Don't get me wrong, it's a great mod, but it still makes me want to pull my eyes out sometimes. Going from earlier, where I had literally nothing to do for hours, to suddenly having everything to do, was quite jarring. But this is the bit we played the game for. Have I mentioned enough how much I just love alien biomes? There's just nothing that looks like this in vanilla, it's incredible. Even if the extra trees and rocks are incredibly annoying to get around. Here's more James Bond shenanigans. Generally though, worms aren't that hard to dodge. You just need to wiggle a bit to throw off the predictive aiming. If you don't turn at all though, they have 100% accuracy. Here's the final result. Yes, I occasionally save scum. Corp. If I ever do die or save scum though, I will show it. I'm only human though. Yeah, I really don't think I'll find anything useful here. Fuck, 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 fuck. That could have gone worse, but we'll live with it. It looks really bad, but that could have been us. I certainly won't be making that mistake again. Meanwhile back downstairs, we have more science to automate. I could probably make this even more compact, but I'm going to be tearing it all up later anyway, so I might as well save a bit of my sanity. I simply need it to work, and more compact and more permanent designs can come later when I have more space and more bots. Automated red and green science is great, but what's really going to push forward is automated blue science, which is our next goal. So once green science is finished and producing, we can move on to fulfilling that goal. We're missing a few resources before we can automate blue science production however, the first of all being steel. Ignore that horrific mistake I made up top there. Here's another quick time lapse, just a snapshot of the current state of the base. Despite all that new space, we're filling it fast. You might have noticed these tanks in the background, but we're moving them over here now. These are the next resource we need for blue science, oil. Since we won't often be hooked up to it, we need a big buffer for when we're between oil fields. The first blue science ingredient we finish is engine units. I'm not building them to any kind of ratio, I just want as many as possible because they're used for flamethrower turrets, as well as other purposes such as pumps and cars. 
which I think we established earlier. I might go through a couple cars in this playthrough. But anyways, I can also set up a blue sign to assemble as themselves. Once this is done, all that will be left is the other two blue signs ingredients, which are both quite simple. The most complicated part is going to be actually getting the oil itself. Here's my solution to that. You might remember the planetary teleporter, which is kind of like a harvester platform without the actual platform bit. We can use it to teleport oil back to our base without using up a precious harvester platform. The obvious downside being I need to remember to come and collect this before I warp away. Immediately I expand the buffer, any time spent not harvesting is a waste. Before I can do anything with the oil though, it's time for the hourly scour for new resource nodes. One thing I hadn't mentioned before is these little loot chests scattered around the planet. They're added by Warp Tario and usually contain some quite useful stuff. That was just rifle ammo, but I've seen things such as assemblers, power poles, gun turrets. It makes these little excursions a lot more rewarding. Once we've found everything we're looking for, we can go back and start processing the oil we're gathering. Unlike engine units, I am building these to a very specific ratio because I want to use as little space as possible. I'm going for 20 blue science a minute, I simply don't have the room or planning skills for anything bigger than that. What's important really is just getting any sort of blue science started. With blue science, I'll be able to get even more platform upgrades, so I'll be able to refactor the base and get even more production later on. What I'm hoping for is that every time we refactor the base, we'll be able to add a new science to it. This means hopefully we'll only have to do it twice more before we can finish the game. You might have noticed in the background I've been building the blue science setup. This is it finished now, we're just waiting for some copper so we can start producing red circuits. However, there was no point shuffling harvester platforms around so late on a planet. So we're going to move on to the next one and we'll get some copper there. Not long after I set off, I realised I've got to bring the eastern harvester platform with me. Thankfully I can just pop down to the harvester floor using the western harvester platform. I still managed to forget the planetary teleporter however, so if I run into oil, I'm a bit screwed. I run into copper before I run into oil however, so I just head back into my base. We have enough oil stocked up for now anyway. As you can see here, all the other sciences were also completely stopped because of no copper. It's another thing that makes this mod so interesting for me, since you can only easily mine from two resources at once. Picking which resources to mine from becomes another strategic choice you have to make. Access to blue science has opened the door to a lot of important researches I've got my eyes on. The obvious ones are mining productivity and more space. However, researches like the one that give us a water source in the boiler floor are also very important. Here we can see some of the very first blue science balls starting to flow. I end up choosing the special warp mining productivity as my first research. This is because more ore throughput is never a bad thing. Especially now that we're producing so much science, we're going to need a lot of resources. Talking about resource shortages, we're now chronically low on iron. There's simply not enough coming in, and any of it is is split across science and ammo production. I upgrade the furnace stack so it can support a red belt of R, but it's a stopgap solution at best, because we're barely even bringing in a yellow belt of R. Our problem with iron will be solved with time and some mining productivity upgrades. Plus, we're harvesting a lot more copper than we're using, so once the buffers are filled we can use both harvesters for iron. First, however, I'm using iron from the buffer chests of the old base to build this semi-automated grenade setup. We don't use military science for too much now, so it's not really worth the space to automate it, however we can hand feed some. First, however, an alarm I set up to go off when the power plant has low coal starts sounding. It would appear that we have low coal. As it turns out, you can only hear it when you're on the same floor as it. If you go back to the last clip, you'll actually see it's been going off for a little while, I didn't even know. So we have to pick up the harvester on the copper and go and find some coal before our power grid completely blacks out. This goes back to what I was saying earlier, to harvest one resource, we have to sacrifice another. I know I could just build mines normally, but I'd have to pull them up before we leave, and without bots, who can be bothered with that? Here's a strange sight. All the inputs for the planetary teleport on the other side have completely disappeared. This happens every single time it gets upgraded, and it's really quite annoying. Probably one of the most annoying bugs in the mod. However, you don't upgrade it very often, so it's not so bad. I can get back to some more hand-fed military science now. Again, this is all just using iron as stockpiled before we refactored the base. While I realise now that I could have, and probably should have, automated military science, it at least gives me something to do while I'm waiting, 
and trust me, with 20 blue signs a minute, I do a lot of waiting. Contrary to popular belief, I do have a bright idea every now and again. I need a lot of oil, and I also need a lot of stone, and I found the two of them right next to each other. So I can bring them both through the planetary teleporter, and not waste a harvester platform on either of them. Of course, this also means I need to make sure I've got the foresight to not be leaving in a rush, because I won't have time to come and pull all this apart. With this stone, we're just going to belt it down to the factory floor and store it in some chests. Since at this point we're only using it for military science, it's all getting hand fed anyway. Then at one point, while I was being productive, like usual, the return of the sound. Not knowing exactly where it is, I instantly assume it's the stone outpost we just built. So I run up there and find... It's completely fine. So what did break? Back to the mad rush. And while we're at it, I decided to leave for some reason, because we couldn't overreact anymore, could we? And in the end it just turns out it was the turret on out of ammo. So we probably could have stayed here a bit longer, to be fair. We had a good thing, you stupid son of a... We had stone. We had a oil. We had everything we needed and it all ran like clockwork. We fix it up, we fill up the turrets, but I still feel a bit stupid for panicking. Once we start warping, we can't cancel it. We also mustn't forget about our planetary teleporter, as we have to pick it all up manually. In some ways, we might almost consider this a blessing in disguise, because I just found this massive oil patch with high richness. This is great because the richer the patch is, the faster the pumps pump. So with any luck, this will easily fill our buffer. Besides this absolutely gargantuan oil patch, this was a pretty boring planet, so we'll just skip to a good bit when we leave. I'm so used to Warp Tario by this point that this base feels absolutely massive. Of course it's not really, it's so small I can fit half of it on my screen at once. Here's the moment of truth, where will we go next? It's a lava planet, wonderful. That wonderful was, if you couldn't tell, dripping with sarcasm. Don't get me wrong, they're still beautiful, but they're also covered in rocks. And you and me both know that Factorio's driving mechanics aren't the best ever, which combined with these strange coloured smudges of slowing stuff on the ground, leads to a very stressful driving experience. In the end, I end up in this beautiful pink forest. You know what, it almost makes it worth it. Almost. But finding nothing to the north, instead go south, with great difficulty. Bet you're sick of hearing me gush about alien biomes at this point. We do, in the end, come across something of use. More oil. We really can never have enough. Hey, I've seen this one before. Sorry. Eventually we find this nice big iron patch. I think I'll put both my harvesters here. If I can find the space. Which I do in the end and then hopefully this will mean our iron problems are no more. Soon we start researching better harvester platforms. Some technologies in Warp Tario actually have an interesting quirk where it takes multiple science bottles to do a single research step. Which is why our red and green science have dried up so much, because every single research step takes two green science, two red science, but only one military science. You can see it briefly when I open the research panel here. Once that's done, that's another major upgrade. You can see how much bigger it is already. I'm confident we can as much as double the number of miners we can fit on this thing. First thing though, these buffers need to go. They were partially destroyed by the harvester expanding, plus we can make it even bigger now since the corridors widened slightly. I place it a bit further away this time, so next time the platform expands it doesn't destroy it again. Now that is a buffer. But what we're really here for is to upgrade this platform. All this iron in the ground makes it really hard to see where the platform ends. Even just from this roughest idea, you can see how much more we're going to be able to fit on this. In the end, this is what I come up with. 35 miners. 
more than three times as many as fits on the smaller platform. Makes me wish I'd done this hours ago. It doesn't even need blue science. Pretty soon, the other one finishes too. I just copy paste the other side, however, a lot of it can't be done until we place it down on an R patch. Which we find eventually, and we can get to work. The reason we couldn't use that massive patch from earlier is because we had to escape that planet. Evolution reached about 35%, and our yellow ammo turrets couldn't keep up with a pure volume of medium biters. Our next step in the game is going to be rectifying that. And there's the finished platform. Here's that water source technology I've been talking about. With this, we don't need that silly pipe wall on the surface and can graduate to a real wall. Anyway, so as you can see here, I've started storing oil on the surface. The oil from the tanks downstairs can flow up to here, but the oil up here can't flow back down. This makes sure that even if we run out of oil downstairs, we still have some left up here. As soon as I arrive on the next planet, I get to work. Ideally, we need at least some defences before the biters show up. Firstly, we have some frame 4 turrets. This is what we want the oil for. Already the hard at work. Frame 4s on their own can be a bit helpless, however, so we need something else to pick off the stragglers. For that, we can just use plain old gun turrets. They're set up much in the same way they were before. Just one long belt, rotating constantly around the entire platform, feeding them. We double layer the walls, so we at least get a notification before they're fully breached. And the final layer of defence is a second set of gun turrets. No particular reason, I just thought one might not be enough. But with that, I think we've quite successfully turned our warp factory into a warp fortress. So without a further ado, thank you for watching, and good night. To kick this video off to an absolutely frying start, I forgot to record the first 20 minutes. So we are starting here, in media res. Fortunately, not too much happened in that time. I added in some turrets which we missed out last time, and placed on the harvest platforms. I decided I'd gathered enough coal, so I took the platform to go and find a new resource patch. <coughs> I took the platform. I took the platform? Oh, for the love of God. And of course, I don't even realise until I reach this dandy little iron patch. Thankfully, I'd brought the planetary teleporter with me, so my life was only a little bit harder. After that little hiccup, however, we're back on track. Thanks to all of our mining productivity upgrades, these platforms use a massive amount of materials, so our buffers fill quickly. In fact, we produce so many we can't get them in fast enough. So I spent some time upgrading all of our input belts into red belts. Once that's done, I decide we waste far too much crude oil using basic oil processing instead of advanced. So I start spitballing a proper oil processing setup on the surface here. The first thing we need extra for advanced oil processing is some water. Which for some stupid reason I decided to take from the surface instead of the literal infinite teleporting water source in the boiler room. I do go back on this mistake later. In the end I decided to put the refineries up here. And finally we start advanced oil processing. As well as obviously getting the advanced oil products, it also gives us more per crude oil. If you do the math and assume you crack all the products down to petroleum, you'll find that while basic oil processing gives you only 45 petroleum, Advanced oil processing gives you 97.5. That's more than double, which makes all the difference when your crude oil is limited. Next we need to set up for cracking, which is difficult usually, but even worse when our space is so limited. I build this setup, but realise I have nowhere to control how much light oil we're cracking. So I have to tear it all down and try again. Painful. I try fitting it in vertically, but logistically it's just not happening. So again, I pull it apart. So we end up with this, which is alright I suppose, but doesn't fit in as well as I'd hoped. Also, there's not enough chemical plants, so if we do need to turn all of that oil into petroleum, it won't be fast enough. With this advanced oil processing now set up, I can hook it up to my blue science and save a butt ton of oil. And I can say bye bye to these. The oil savings are nice, but what I've really did this far is electric engines. Anyone who's played Factorio before knows why. We don't need to mass produce them yet, so a shoddy little hand fed setup will do. Soon, a new upgrade comes through to completely ruin all of my pipes along the staircases. It adds an extra load of chest pair to every staircase and the two harvester platforms, essentially doubling our potential throughput at these spots. However, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't at least a little bit annoyed about having to redo all the piping. 
The biggest upgrade this has given us is the ability to take a full red belt from both harvester platforms up to the main floor, We're very preferable over this weird mixed rainbow belt. I still need to sort this second belt, which is starting to turn this hair into a delectable bit of spaghetti. Once finished however, it actually looks a lot better than I expected. Something we really need if we want to stay on these planets for much longer is automated repairs on the surface. So I put this robo part down, which is enough to cover the entire defences on the surface. However, miners are starting to get destroyed, so I decide to leave. I can't fix that with bots, I just need better harvester platform designs. The next planet we end up on is a peaceful one, and unlike usual, we actually have a use for it this time. We got a new harvester platform upgrade, so I'm using this time to redesign it for the larger size. Also, we need to put turrets on the outside, as spitters were able to snipe the miners without getting shot before. And since we can't place miners without R, I'm using assembly machines as placeholders, since they're the same size. Putting all the belts in is the hardest part, as we want approximately the same amount of miners unloading at both sides of the belt. It doesn't need to be perfect, but I want it to be damn close including bouncing these belts halfway to maximise throughput. Once that's finished, I set up an easy little hand-fed bot setup on the surface. Again, we really don't need that many, probably about 100 will be enough. And we can just leave some resources in to start it chugging along. We mustn't forget the most important addition to the platform, defences. We have enough room for a lot of turrets here, however, for now, four on each corner will probably suffice. Quickly here, I had a new mod called Fill For Me. This essentially makes it so when you place down turrets, it adds in ammo automatically, as you can see here. Unfortunately, I made the mistake of having a tiny bit of red ammo in my inventory, so it didn't quite work as expected. This is how it should work. It makes it much easier to place down defences quickly, which should hopefully help me play a lot more actively in future. All of those extra miners are going to push the limits of my power plant, so I decided to expand it a bit. I can continue to expand this monstrosity all I want for now, but eventually it is going to need a redesign. It just takes up so much space, especially in a mod where space matters so much. Anyway, we find ourselves on a new planet, so it's time to go and get some use out of that new mining platform. I don't show it so much anymore, but a lot of this mod is spent just driving across the surface trying to find resource patches. It sucks for sure, but the further we progress, the more time we can spend on our planet, which means the less we have to do this. Here we find some crude oil, which is an absolute lifesaver, because we didn't have too much left. It's a pain having to set these up so often. In some ways, this mod can exacerbate some of the more tedious parts of vanilla. Here we can yet again see the use of fill for me, saving me some precious seconds. Contrary to how I talk about this mod sometimes, I do actually really enjoy it. To paraphrase one of my favourite YouTubers, Atomic Shrimp, the funnest problems to solve are interesting shaped ones. I interpret interesting shaped to mean one you don't really experience anywhere else. I think Warped Torbio 2 fits this criteria perfectly. It presents situations you've never seen before, and forces you to come up with solutions completely unique to this mod. All of that, without changing any vanilla recipes, and only adding a few new ones. In this way, it's an overhaul mod not because it changes the recipes, but because it completely changes the gameplay loop itself. But enough waxing poetically about the game, we've hit a dead end. This was a low resource density planet, which I'm usually alright with, but this time it just kind of sucked. Right now, our buffers are empty, so we really need to be pulling in a lot of resources. So I'm gonna dip. Ah, bugger. So, that's what happens when you don't stand on the platform when it teleports. My curiosity overtakes me, I need to know if this will work like it used to. It does not. I could play on from here, but I'd kind of be missing out on the entire point of the game, so I won't. Saves coming it is. Luckily I saved like literally 20 seconds before the platform teleported. Next we end up on what I like to call a something is missing planet. Named creatively thanks to the message that comes up in the chat when you land there. It does what it says on the tin, it doesn't have any of some kind of resource. It does have iron though, so there's that. I still have some assembly machines to replace with miners. I already did some of them on the last planet while I was waiting to teleport. And no, I don't notice until very far down the line that those miners in the middle are just mining straight into the harvester platform teleporter. Hindsight is 2020 and all that. Here we can see some more strange harvester platform shenanigans. That turret is entirely inside that miner. I literally can't reach it to put ammo in. 
Now that we have the means to stay on planet Songa thanks to our defences, I'm starting to research some warp reactor upgrades to increase our auto warp timer. We can also research the next upgrade straight after that. The next upgrade after the one researching now completely removes the auto warp timer, meaning we can stay on planets for as long as our turrets can fend off the biters. Remember like 30 seconds ago when I showed those miners which were partially clipped into the other platform? This is the result of that. Whichever platform gets picked up first, picks up all the entities on top of it, even if they were part of another platform already, which can sometimes lead to goofy situations like that. And that next reactor research finally finishes. This one actually manifests a physical reactor in the world. However, it's not very good, so I don't really know what the point of it is. It outputs half the amount of power of just a single regular nuclear reactor. Perhaps more upgrades will increase its energy output, I genuinely have no idea. If you can count and have been paying attention, you might have noticed that our newly upgraded harvester platform doesn't actually have that many more miners than the old one. However, it does have one big advantage over the old one, being that it can fit fluid input for the miners. With just a small redesign, we can incorporate the fluids into our setup and start delivering sulfuric acid to the miners. This will be essential when we start mining uranium. So we should probably go find some. And we do, but it's far too close to a big alien base. We could try place the platform down, but even if it's out of the range of the worms, it's still going to get assaulted constantly by biters. I try anyway, but it's clear it's not going to work. However, they stand no chance against just some turret spam. I'll probably lose a ton of them, but it's worth it for the quirky green rocks. It's not worth almost dying though. Whatever space those turrets manage to clear is probably enough. It appears to be. They don't seem to get activated by any defensive fire. I realise my mistake as soon as I come into my base. I've got to add new splitters to handle the uranium ore. I want it sent down to the boiler floor, because that's where I'm going to process the uranium. Once down there, I set up a quick hand-fed concrete setup, because we'll need it for the centrifuges. I can only afford one for now, they're incredibly expensive for such a low production base. However, I'm planning to get many more in the future. This is because, in absence of any space to make solar, nuclear is the king of power in this mod. The reactors produce tons of power and are incredibly cheap to run once they're built. Especially once I have Corvrex enrichment which could probably turn 10 minutes of mining uranium into tens of hours of power. Corvrex is a long way away, however, locked behind purple science, so for now all I can do is gather up resources. Most importantly, I need to gather 40 uranium-235 so I can kickstart the Corvrex process once I research it. I also build a big buffer for the uranium R, because we're going to need a lot of it. Even as pollution passes 50%, our defences are holding up pretty well. I don't even really need to consider the warp platform when I've decided I'm to warp or not anymore. The big problem is the harvester platforms, as there's much less space for defences. At this point, my decision on whether to warp or not is decided entirely on how they are holding up. My turret creep at the uranium pack is emboldened me to make stupid mistakes elsewhere. This is just a massive waste of resources, there's plenty of copper elsewhere on the planet. And the worst part is that it didn't even work. It's far too close to the other nests in the base so any defensive fire will likely pull dormant biters which wouldn't have attacked otherwise. Hang on a minute, I've seen this one before. One thing I didn't know that happened is it actually brings the biters with you. They aren't even supposed to be able to get on this floor. So after that fiasco and a lot of dead ends, I make the informed decision that this planet is shit and we're leaving. Here at least we find a slightly more worthwhile battle. This is a nest size where you have a chance of killing. Miraculously, despite the turrets being literally right in front of the worms, the only casualties we suffer is my car. If I didn't have a teleporter in my pocket, that would have been a long walk home. In other news, we've finally saved up enough resources for an entire second centrifuge. Truly are living our best life. I finally decided that this power plant needs to go. It's horrifically space inefficient and wrapped up in the middle here like some sort of weird knot. 
So I'll measure about and see if I can fit it in one of the arms of the boiler room. And it looks like I can quite easily. You might wonder what the belts were for if I could just put the machines down in the first place. And the simple answer is, I'm thick. In the end, we actually have so much space, we can do this fancy thing where you offset the steam engines, so you can put them all side by side. You can hear, just from the sound of the steam engines, how stretched our power grid is right now. Just to listen to it come alive. For some reason at this point, I'm still hand reading military science. However, I make one small step forward by fully automating grenades. And oh my god, what do you know, we can afford an entire third centrifuge. Woo, that's what I'm talking about, baby. Sometimes I like to come up here and watch the fireworks. It's a nice break from doing nothing downstairs. If I could go back to when I started this mod and give myself one tip, it would be that harvester platforms aren't the be all and end all. I spent far too much time while playing this mod with nothing to do, when what I could be doing is bringing in trickles of resources from the surface. The little turret things in the corner of the factory floor are perfect for this purpose. And I can run the lines in and just fill up chests on the other side. This is perfect for things like coal and stone, which you only need trickles of, so it's not worth wasting a whole harvester platform on them. Grenades are fully automated, and walls are incredibly easy to make by hand. That means that the only ingredient for military science we can't easily obtain is red ammo. So I'm going to do that next. You might ask why I haven't just fully automated military science if I'm going to do all this. And to answer this question, I'd like to introduce you to the secondary antagonist of the series. My own goddamn laziness. You heard that right. I'd rather spend the literal hours hand feeding military science than just automate it and use a little bit of brain power. Before I started playing Factorio, I couldn't even comprehend the idea of procrastinating a game, never mind my favourite game. A sudden alert breaks me from my stupor. Oh shit, what's broken now? Fortunately, I have a pretty good idea where it'll be. Those gun turrets I left around the stone mine only had yellow ammo in them, so if I'm honest, I'm impressed they even lasted this long. It's mostly still standing, but I decided it's not worth the risk leaving it here. As I was saying before I was so rudely interrupted, if they've done it once, they can definitely do it again. Unfortunately, there's just a limit for how we leave these out here without any proper defence. And no way Jose was a piping oil out to these just to keep the trickle of stone going for another couple minutes. And coming in is centrifuge number four. I know it doesn't seem like that big a deal, but when you only have 6 red circuit assemblers and most of it's going to science, 100 red circuits is a lot. New planet, new problems. We have some new developments to catch up on now. For a start, our gun turrets don't do enough damage, so we're researching all of the projectile damage upgrades we can with our current science packs. This includes an extra one added by Warptario. Also, we've researched another new thing, warp abilities. They use a steadily increasing amount of power and in return benefit us in some way. The one I'm currently using, Stabilizer, stops our platform producing pollution for as long as it's active. We only produce enough power to keep it on for 2 or 3 minutes, but that's 2 or 3 minutes without bite of attacks. The amount of power it consumes resets every time you warp, which means you can quite happily use it for a bit straight away each time you start on a new planet. There are two other abilities, but they're both a bit useless. There's Chart, which says it reveals an area on the main platform, but I can't seem to figure out how to use it. And then there's Accelerate, which speeds up the warp charge timer, but only by a negligible amount. Overall, I think Stabilize is just the best and most obvious choice. Routing this coal belt through our base is actually beginning to present itself as quite a difficult challenge. Our base is just so densely packed on the bridges around here, it's almost impossible to get the coal through. After surveying it for a moment, I decided to dead end, but I have a better idea anyway. First, I do a little loop de loop around the staircase. I've done that a lot whilst playing this mod. Walk up a staircase I didn't intend to. 
So here's my master plan, route it through the furnace setup. And honestly, it works pretty good. As it turns out, this setup's actually two tiles wider than it needs to be. Later on when I remake my base again, I'll fix that. There's an alarm sounding on the boiler floor, it's been starved of coal for too long. There's only three chests of coal left, which might have lasted us quite a while, but it's better to be safe than sorry. Soon I realised that the coal loop de loop, while extravagant, was also completely unnecessary. Jokes aside, the real reason is that there's another resource up here that I want to bring through. First however, I need to wait for this coal chest to drain. But whilst I wait, I can go and get the miners ready on the other side. I am of course getting more stone. Pretty soon, that chest's emptied and we can hook the line up to some buffer chests instead. Now that we have red ammo automated, we have only the very best defending our mining outpost. We don't even have this stuff at our main base. Then again, I suppose that does have flame throw turrets, two tile thick walls, eh, forget about it. Once this damage upgrade finishes, we have five more researches we can do to upgrade the size of our base. After that, this factory floor won't get any bigger until we can start producing purple science. It's going to be a hell of a lot more expensive than anything we've produced up to this point, but it'll hopefully give us some powerful upgrades which will help to offset this. And no, your eyes do not deceive you, I am still hand feeding coal, like a blithering buffoon. And I also completely accidentally caught that upgrade happening. Once I've upgraded all four turrets, I'll be able to upgrade the bridges in between them. This will give us a bit more space around where the furnace stacks are, and maybe allow us to squeeze some more stuff in. The end goal is to compress what we have into a much smaller footprint, which will leave us some space to make the other sciences. Like I said before, purple science is the goal, but I'm also looking to hand feed some yellow science so we can unlock logistics research. Request the chests are going to be a game changer for any sort of relatively low throughput items. Don't get me wrong, belts always win on speed, but bots always win on versatility. Anyway, it's starting to get a bit feisty out here on the surface, so I'm heading over to pull in the mining outpost. Evolution's past 50% now, and the convenience of staying here isn't worth the bullets it's going to take to defend against big biters. If you didn't already hold the belief when starting this mod that every setup is a temporary setup, you'll be a firm believer by the end of it. This mod will make you real familiar with packing things up and leaving. I make the grave mistake of starting the warp timer already. Can you guess what I've forgotten? If I remember correctly, I realise about here what I've done. Seeing the planetary teleporter made me immediately realise I hadn't brought in the bloody oil setup. I grab what I can, but miss some turrets in the rush. It certainly could have been worse, I suppose. I built this little rocket fuel setup at some point, though I can't find the footage. I mostly just want it for my car. However, it's good to stockpile some for the end of the game. But I think we'll probably make a much bigger setup once we get closer to launching the rocket. Before I can even get 50 tiles away from my base, I realise I've again forgotten the harvester platforms. It's a good job I realised when I did, because without the planetary teleporter, that mistake would have cost us a lot of time. Cheeky drive-by placement. Here, I start planning what our base is going to look like once we've upgraded these bridges. I make the, what I think is a quite reasonable assumption, that the covered hours are going to be the same size as the rooms were, just like the last upgrade. That assumption is, well... I guess you'll see. Immediately. For those of you that don't really understand what's wrong with this, the size I was expecting would have fit two furnace stacks in a corridor. This one only fits one. And this is the final upgrade for the bridges. This is as big as they get. But there's no use crying over spilled milk. There's still things I need to do. Namely, there's a specific technology which will hopefully alleviate a lot of the space and logistical issues we're facing. That of course being the logistics network research. However, it's locked behind 500 yellow science, which is what I'm working on now. Some extra plastic for low density structure. Some quick dirty assemblers to make blue chips. And we actually already have a little flying robot frame set up on the surface here. I've got plenty of construction robots up here now, so I can take any spare robot frames down to make yellow science. I set up a circuit to only add new robots to the robo part if we have less than 100. This means I can skim most of the frame production, but if it needs it, it can still take some to make more construction bots. And finally, I make the actual LDS assemblers. We need this the most, as we use one for every yellow science, as opposed to two processing units and one robot frame per three yellow science. 
If you do the math, that means we need to make a whole 500 LDS, 334 processing units, and 167 robot frames. And here's the little setup that's going to make it all. Assuming that we had enough intermediates to keep this running constantly, which I don't think we do, just this little setup would take almost an hour to produce all the other science we need. Thankfully, I've done a lot of waiting so far, and I'm mentally prepared to do a lot more. Once we had some robot frames, our first little bottles of yellow science start to produce. It's going to be a long journey before we get any use out of them. For me, it won't be any more than a couple minutes for you. As luck would have it, our next warp lands us on. Peaceful planet. Normally, just the sight of it might sadden me. However, I have another use for it. Off screen, I've been putting together some personal robot part equipment, which will hopefully make what I'm about to do quite a bit easier. So I cut off the iron line and put those bots to use. Now, instead of spending two minutes doing it myself, I get to watch something else do it for two minutes. It truly is the pinnacle of advancement. This isn't as impactful now I've realised I can only fit one furnace stack here instead of two. However, in a mod like this, you've really just got to take the space when it's given to you. The reason that this design's better isn't immediately obvious just from looking at it. I mean, yeah, it's two tiles thinner, but where have those two columns gone? I mean, there's still three columns of belts and two columns of furnaces. The answer is that we put the input and the output inserters in the same column. I think that's really the beauty of this game, because you can play it for 900 hours and not even realise something like this. But when you go on the internet and see someone who's been playing for like, five hours, who's already figured this out. So now we can just copy that little design down the stack and move on to our other space saving endeavours. My first idea is that I'm like, yeah, 90% sure I can fit both my red and green science into this little area where I was fitting just my red science. But that first involves tearing apart a lot of the old base, including that yellow science book I'd just built. But it's fine, we'll put it somewhere else. I laid out 10 assemblers for red science and 12 for green science, which is enough for 60 signs per minute, which we probably won't use, but it's there for if we do. But I'm going to put all my cards on the table right here and now. It's going to be an absolute miracle if we get anything above military science at 60 SPM. It'd be nice, and we'll see what happens when we get some more research, but I'm not going to make any promises. It's not that serious. Why do things by bots when you have the power of hand? If only I used that little fancy technique I was talking about earlier to save space here. Because as far as I know, there's nothing you can do with a two tile wide corridor, but if it was four tiles wide, well that'll fit an assembler. But alas, as usual, recording me is editing me's worst enemy. My next little space saving technique is to move that big eyesaw of an oil storage from down there to up here where I'll hopefully see it slightly less. And also I feel like it just makes sense to have the oil storage with the oil processing. And the next thing to go is the labs, so we can move them a whole two tiles down. Ground breaking stuff chaps, pat yourselves on the back. And we can say goodbye to blue science, because we're hopefully going to compress this down also into a small footprint. As usual, we'll just start with the assemblers and work our way down the list until we end up back at the stuff that makes it all up. I believe that the word that I was looking for was raw resources, but stuff sounds good. The first ingredients have caused sulphur, which we don't need a lot of, so I'm just going to put one chemical plant right here, right in front of the science production. And we can then proceed with a bit more um, scheduled demolition. Also, in the background, I was pumping over oil from this storage tank up to the surface, the one we built up there, so we can get rid of that now. As it turns out, I saved a bit too much space, and now I can't quite get this belt of coal past the belt and insert of assemblers, so I need to take it all the way around and up the other side. But we're going to use that coal to make plastic, which is going to make red circuits, which we'll use for the blue sides. But the idea is that we're going to make a bit more than we need, so then we can use all of the excess to trickle feed some yellow and purple science. It's going to end up being about twice as much as we need. Which I mean, I don't even know if we can support that with what we currently have incoming, but it's worth a try. I feel like especially once we have purple science up, I'm going to be doing a lot more resource collecting and a lot less building, so I want to do this right the first time. Anyway, so in our whistle stop tube with blue science, we now have sulphur and red circuits, and the only thing left is the engines. Now, they're a lot easier than circuits, but there's something we haven't rebuilt yet, which we're going to have to do soon, which is steel. So I procrastinate it and go and tear up old setups. 
but then I go and actually do it and you're gonna get a bit of deja vu here. Now obviously if I had more than say 7 active brain cells at the same time, I would have just copy and pasted my foot in a stack, but that's too easy apparently. But we need to rebuild all of it by hand again. But you don't need to see that, so wow look at that. Completed furnace stack. Pretend I did that in like two seconds and not like five minutes. Anyway, so what do you know? I've got to leave any space for the pipe and gear production, so I've got to put it up here, even past the steel furnaces. But like, it works. It gets to this engine production fine. It almost feels like I planned it, but I didn't. But we can pretend I did. So yeah, with that connected, our blue science is now technically working in a much smaller footprint to what it was in before. So now, obviously, what you're thinking is the next logical step. It's going to be automate military science. And now you're thinking, oh, you know, he's going to take a little chicane, going to set up some yellow science, it makes sense. And then he's going to automate military science. And then I go down to the harvest floor and start, you know, expanding my stone brother. But it makes sense, because he needs stone for military science. And now he's handcrafting military science again. You know, like, I wish I could just reach around into the past and just slap myself across the face but it is fine because we're almost at the end and now next time I can do it right and I inevitably won't and I will complain about myself in post but enough of that I think yeah well science has come along nicely we're getting there towards 500 I knew it wasn't going to be fast so it's fine I mean I'm not struggling to keep the setup fed anyway so there's that now I actually have productivity modules in my labs, so we don't need exactly 500 yellow science. And I get like 460 ish, I just assume it's probably going to be enough. Don't assume. Just quickly in the middle here while you ponder over why exactly I said don't assume. You have a quick update on like the whole resource loading situation. I'm bringing coal up from the uh, harvester floor now to into the factory floor which is going to just make things a lot easier when we're automating some certain sciences. Because what I'm really wanting here is just a little trick of purple science to really get us through some of the good technologies, which will really benefit us. We haven't had like a pointless little overview of the defences on the surface in a while, so here you are. That is a lot of biters, but that's also a lot of bullets. This isn't really a criticism of a mod, it's more of a criticism of the actual game Factorio itself, but when you get to this point, with your flame throws and your gun turrets, you don't even really need to think about defence. But definitely give this mod some credit, you do have to think about the resources you provide in for these defences, because in vanilla it almost feels infinite, but when you actually have to think about which resources you have, how much you have left, like you do in this mod, it adds a new sort of layer to the whole defence thing. But yeah, so remember what I was saying about don't assume anything. Well, if you look here, our research bar appears to have ground to a screeching halt at 99%, which is, suffice to say, not good, because our yellow science build is no longer there. So I'm going to do the worst thing imaginable, something you should never do, and I would probably say most people have not done, and handcraft yellow science. No, no, you can put the pitch box away, it was only a couple, but that gets us the rest of the way to logistics research. So we can now put down the quest chest. So I'll put down the robo part, handcraft some logistic bots, and put down some request chests. And no, we won't be building a little internal gravy train for the base. These rails are of course for our production science. And produce we shall. If you'd even believe how pathetic it is, our red circuit build can't even keep up with this tiny little purple science build. But I think by this point I decided that was a problem for future me because I'd got my purple science and I thought that sounded like a nice little end to the episode. And the proof's right here. We have the little purple bottles in the box but we won't use them until next time. So thank you for watching. Au revoir. Auf Wiedersehen. And see you in the next one. Oh, see you there. It has been 20 hours since the warp drive malfunctioned, and in that time, I've been thrown across 57 dimensions, scrambling for resources to secure my base and fix the vessel. I have a claustrophobic, messy factory built below the platform, and a strong, secure fortress on the surface. To fix the warp drive and return home, 
I must continue to research and to develop my factory. All the while, I cannot let my guard down, for my factory lives on the knife's edge, under siege constantly, while resources are limited. The first thing I want is to set up a way to automatically send any resources we want from the factory floor to the surface. To do this, we will use logistics bots as well as some circuit tricks in a dedicated staircase loader. I'll spare the technical details, but how this essentially works is by comparing how many resources we have in the logistics system to the values we have set in this combinator, and then, if the system has less of an item than the value in the combinator, the item is set as a request in the chest downstairs, which is then delivered to that chest, which is then delivered to the surface. This allows us to do things like automatically request repair packs, replacement bots, replacement buildings, and other such things so the surface defence can work without almost any assistance from us. It's worth noting what I realised here, which is that loaders have to go from a building to a belt, or a belt to a building. They cannot go from a building to a building, so having the request the chest right in front of the loader didn't work. I ended up having to place a belt and an inserter between them. Land on a new type of planet we've never seen before, covered in trees and called a jungle planet. Whilst you watch me struggle through the foliage here, I want to talk about our plans for this episode. Overall, the biggest limitation in this playthrough is going to be resource input, so to compensate for this, we're going to want the productivity of this shit out of every assembler we can. Furthermore, providing ammo to harvester platforms by hand is an inefficient use of our time, and it's not sustainable long term, so laser turrets are on the cards. A common issue, or perhaps prerequisite of both of these things, is power. Spoilers. We are not running hundreds of megawatts of machinery on coal, so before we can kick any of these plans into motion, we need to get nuclear energy set up. To provide fuel for the reactor, we need lots of uranium-235, meaning we need Corvorex, because getting that amount of 235 is not feasible by mining alone in this mod. With this information, we can build a checklist of what we need to do this episode. Step 1. Acquire 1500 purple science. Step 2. Research the Corvorex enrichment process. Step 3. Get 40 uranium-235 to kickstart the enrichment process. Step 4. Build a nuclear reactor. Step 5. Set up laser turrets and productivity modules. Step 6. Profit. It might not all be in that exact order, as to get the 1500 purple science is a matter of waiting, but we might get the required amount of uranium whilst it accumulates. Anyway, I decide that this jungle planet is lame and really annoying to navigate, so it's time to move on. Now on a new planet, I find the tiniest little dinky uranium patch on my way out. So I put down my harvester platform to start chipping away at the insane amount of uranium we need to get the required 40 U-235. According to the wiki, it takes on average 57,140 uranium ore to get the required amount, but I of course need to get more than that in case I get quite unlucky. To facilitate the collection of this 57,140 plus or minus about 10,000 uranium ore, I need a bigger buffer. A single steel chest can hold 2,400 uranium ore, so I want at least 20 of those, but it can't hurt to have some more. It's at this point we change our character's colour to green, as symbolism for our devotion to one true power source. I also build some more centrifuges to help work through the accumulated R. I have an idea of how to give us a better estimate of how much uranium we need. There is a 0.7% chance that uranium processing cycle will give us U-235, meaning that if we multiply the number of uranium R by 0.1 to give us the number of processing cycles, and then by 0.007 to estimate how many of those will provide us with U-235 for a total multiplication of 0.0007, it will, in effect, give us an estimate of how much U-235 our buffer dial will provide us. Naturally, I don't key it up the first time, giving us an estimate of above 100 when it should actually be 10. I get that fixed and seeing that we have 18 uranium-235, we need to get the little number up to 22, or something more like 25, to be safe, and we should be able to last indefinitely on this amount of uranium alone, if we use Corvorex. Anyway, we jump to a new planet, and end up finding this massive uranium patch, so hopefully this will be the last one we ever need to tap. Our surface defences as they are, are incredibly robust, and we can quite easily make them more so using some lasers and wall mazes. So usually, the limiting factor on how long we can stay on the planet, is actually how well our harvester platforms are holding up, not necessarily the base itself. Even when the harvesters are far outside our warp platform's pollution cloud, miners are one of the most polluting buildings in the game, so they can pull in a lot of biters. To solve this, and extend how long we can stay on the planet, 
I quickly get some efficiency modules semi-automated. I put them straight into my miners on the left harvest platform, as it is the larger one currently. Using three efficiency modules in each miner leads to a maximum 80% decrease in pollution, which translates to an 80% decrease in biter attacks, extending the lifetime of the harvest platform so we can stay on a given planet for longer. It also, of course, decreases the power consumption of the miners by 80% which is welcomed considering how much we are struggling with power. The factory floor is the most convenient place to build, also making its space the most sought for in the whole vessel. To free up some more space there, I'm planning to move my spelting down to the harvester platform, so iron and copper are taken from the mines, straight into furnaces. This ore buffer is in the way, but rather than move it all myself, I disconnect the inputs and build around it while it drains. I'm using the same design I used upstairs, but I want to make the most out of all the space down here, so I build a sort of chicane in the middle to fit all 48 furnaces needed to satisfy a red belt around the outside instead of taking up the middle of the room. I begin the slow process of untying this Gordian knot in the centre here. It served its purpose well, but it can be a headache deciphering sometimes. Previously, iron and copper could go through either chest on the right there, but in the future I plan for each platform to specify in either iron or copper so the only items which need to be sorted are the lesser resources. To save too much redesigning now, I route the iron over to where the old iron smelter is, where I will remove the old smelter, buffer the plates coming in, and plug it in like the smelter was. All of this is not really saving as much space right now, but it's in, an investment which we will benefit from later. Whilst we've been doing all of this, a lot of purple science has been accumulating. One more big step towards Coverex. Our biggest bottleneck for purple science is steel, so in the interest of saving some hours of my life, I decided to set up some supplemental steel from excess iron ore. I'm not going to route it up to the factory floor, I'll just pick it up out of the chest and dump it into whatever process is lacking steel, or just the logistics system if I have a lot kicking around. A good thing to always remember in this mod is that you're not limited to only using the harvester platforms to harvest resources. I often find that due to the absurd mining productivity upgrades this mod provides, even a few miners produce massive amounts of resources, so little outposts like these can be very effective. Exploring is a lot easier now with bots, as these massive alien biomes forests stand no chance against my deconstruction planner. In the end, despite my previous tips about placing the harvester platforms as far away as possible, I end up just plonking one right on the starter patch, because I can't find any iron elsewhere, and I need to keep producing purple science. I accidentally placed the wrong harvester platform for a moment however, leading to iron ore coming up to my factory floor despite nowhere to smelt it. I just shot it in a buffer chest for now, it's not even worth the effort of moving to the smelters. Whilst we might not want to power on a nuclear reactor until we have Corvrex nearly set up, we can certainly build it. I'm going with a 2x2 reactor, giving us a potential of 480 megawatts of power, which should be more than enough to see us through to the rocket. This requires 48 heat exchangers and a whopping 84 turbines, but we can just place the turbines down as we need more power, doesn't need to be all at once. To save as much uranium as possible, we will be smartly controlling reactor burns using a massive steam storage array and only inserting fuel when the steam is low. This has the effect of turning the power plant from a constant producer like a solar panel to a demand producer like a steam engine, meaning that if we only use 240 megawatts, we will only use half as much fuel as we would at, at 480 megawatts. I made a YouTube short about this a while ago and people told me this was useless in the vanilla game because uranium is plentiful. But in a mod like this where uranium's limited, it absolutely shines. If you want a tutorial of how to do this, go and watch that shot, as I wouldn't want to get bogged down in the detail here. In preparation for Coverex finishing, I set it up in the corner here so that I can just copy the recipe in once the research is finished and get it going. I also get the fuel inserters ready. I have enough uranium stocked up that I can happily start the reactor now and have enough fuel to last us until Coverex finishes, so I'm preparing to do that. We throw some fuel in, starting the process now. We don't actually have any steam turbines placed yet, so the steam will be just going into storage because I want enough stored up to make the transfer from coal to nuclear as seamless as possible. I start by replacing just a few steam engines with turbines. I don't want to rush too fast and find a flaw in the design, but look at that, works like a charm. We can now safely remove the coal plant, and with that, our base is entirely reliant on nuclear power. It's also on this time that Corvrex finishes researching, so we can add the recipe in for centrifuge, and wave bye bye to any thoughts of power issues for the foreseeable future. With our nuclear power plant now operational, we have a lot of spare power kicking around we can utilise. Our biggest resource drain currently is iron plates being spent as ammo on the surface, 
So why don't we take some of the strain off of iron production and move it on to power production? I'm a firm believer that the best defense incorporates a little bit of every technique. So we will only replace the front layer of gun turrets with lasers. Lasers do more damage as biters have no resistance to them, but to balance this they shoot quite a bit slower. The most important thing though is that they have two and a half times as much health as gun turrets, so they can take more of a beating from spitters, making them ideal for the very front lines. With this, we have completely replaced our outer layer with lasers. Next up is the harvester platforms. We can replace all of our defences on these with laser turrets, as they can happily take on mid-sized groups, as long as there is enough of them. I decide in the end to just completely redesign the platform if I'm out taking it apart, most importantly, preparing it for later when I have the potential for three lanes worth of output. I also decide to outfit it with a radar, so we can see what's going on around it. We only have one more upgrade until we reach the maximum platform size, so we are closing in on the final design. The other one is not yet upgraded, but we can still give it laser turrets, leaving us with one less thing to restock. You might remember earlier, when I was discussing our time spent on a given planet, I said that the biggest limiting factor was how well the harvester platforms could survive, not the main platform itself. Well, the boot is back on the other foot now, as our harvester platforms deal quite well, but the main platform struggles past around 60% pollution. I proposed two upgrades, one being laser turrets, and the other one being wall mazes. Since the laser turrets are already done, I'll get around to the wall mazes. I researched an upgrade for the platform size, but we will leave the inner walls where they are. Then, on the spare platform outside, I can place these long wall segments with holes in them, which serve a dual purpose. On one hand, they extend the distance a fighter has to go to reach a wall, since it has to path following the chicanes, and on the other hand, it forces many biters through the same spot, increasing the effectiveness on the flamethrowers massively. Whilst waiting for walls to produce, my oil outpost starts getting torn apart and I don't know why. It has a lot of laser turrets, it's barely in my pollution cloud, so what could the problem be? Well, it's that bloody planetary teleporter. As it turns out, it can only pull through 2 megawatts from the main platform which is of course not nearly enough for 17 laser turrets and 9 pump jacks to share. The turrets stand by, impotent, helplessly watching the biters slowly chew through their brethren. Thankfully, the fix is obvious and easy. There is a technology to increase the teleporter's potential discharge rate, so I can just up research a few tiers of that. I find a flaw with my walls. The outermost layer is so far away that spitters can happily chew away it without being interrupted by my turrets. Because of this, I end up knocking off the outside layer and set up just two rows of maze. It'll still certainly be enough. Anyway, with that finished, we should hopefully be able to stay on planets for a bit longer. We can move on to our next project. Initially, I planned to use steel furnaces for my next upgrade to my smelting capacity, but then I realised, why would I want to do that when I have 480 megawatts worth of power under my feet? Electric furnaces are a no-brainer at this point, but there is one issue. You see, electric furnaces are big, big, being by area, over twice as large as steel furnaces. So if we wanted to have as much production using electric furnaces as we could with steel furnaces, it has the potential to take up much more space. But with some tier 1 speed modules, we can just about fit in two red belts worth into our currently sized harvester floor. Even better, it's completely brain dead to plug in. No belt mixing required, just run the line of ours straight into the furnaces. I've out the plates in where the copper ore was going earlier and I can plug it straight onto the copper line of a priority splitter to only add it on once the entire copper ore buffer is emptied. With the groundwork mostly set, it's time to iterate our factory into its next farm. Due to the massive buffs Warp to Oreo gives to logistic bots, I think a bot base is in order. We free up some space on the right here for the beating heart of every base, its green circuit production. Ironically, despite this being planned to be a primarily bot base, at its heart, the green circuit production will be belted, simply because it's needed in such magnitude. It's not actually a massive amount of production yet, however if we find later that we need more we can add some bot based green circuits as well, but this one leaves space for some potential speed beacons, so hopefully that won't be necessary. Belts take up an absolutely massive amount of space currently, so I'm hoping by their removal we can fit much bot production in this into an area roughly the same size. Though it will be tempting to fill the whole thing up, we're going to want to leave some space for space science production. Once our platform trilord has finished researching, we are going to upgrade the two lanes of iron and copper which might not seem like a lot, but that beacon in the middle covers the whole floor and it's full of productivity modules. A single assembler with increased productivity has only a minimal effect on resource usage, but every single assembler having productivity applied can make a massive difference 
especially in long production chains. Next up, we upgrade the iron smelting to electric furnaces, bringing us one step closer to our fully functional base. I tear down the bottom left of the factory floor, leaving us room to work on the next part of the base. We have green circuits with a heart, this is the aorta. That's right, it's red circuits. We start with a tiny compact plastic build right in the corner, and then move on to the main event. I'll be honest, by likelihood it probably won't even be enough, but the beauty of bot is, is that you can shut down more production when and wherever you want. Landing on a new planet, I'm feeling brave, so I try to take on this big base covering an iron patch using only turret creep. Surprisingly, it goes very well, only losing a few turrets in the process. It's worth noting that every new planet I'm going to, I'm starting off using the warp stabiliser, which stops my warp platform producing pollution while it's activated, to eke out as much extra time on every planet as possible. It's only limited by my power production, so I also have the capability to run it for quite a long time thanks to the nuclear power plant. I then try to turret creep using lasers, which is a bit less successful. I wipe out half a nest with them, but lose a few, and overall it just really wasn't worth it. Back in the factory, I set up red and green science. As stated previously, everything is getting productivity modules, as we want as much production as possible from our limited resource input. I also build a bigger and better steel build over here. I was under the impression steel could not benefit from productivity for some reason, so I built it in another one of the outer corridors, where the central beacon doesn't reach to save space in the middle of items that I thought could be productivity. With this, we can erase the old steel build, leaving us more area to build a power bot base. We next build blue circuits. Again, I'm not building to any specific ratio, as half of the fun of the game is running around fixing bottlenecks later. I just want enough production to get working through science. The hardest part about bot bases is the fluids, so I'm dedicating this corner to the recipes that need fluids, and thankfully only three recipes needed for science actually require them. As always, we need a lot of engines, so this entire top right corner is full of them. I also get our blue science down, kicking off another major step in getting this base operational. In my infinite wisdom, I decide to sit inside the wall maze whilst looking at the map, leading to my demise. I'd love to provide any explanation, but I think the simple answer is that I am just incredibly stupid. I have a quite bright idea for low density structure production, if I do say so myself, where I pull the copper straight off one of the belts that feed the green circuits, instead of bringing it in by bots. It requires some shuffling things around, but it certainly works. Obviously, and I'm sure you are absolutely sick of hearing this by now, this isn't going to be enough. But I was closing in on 11 hours of footage here, and I was just sort of rushing towards getting to a reasonable end point. All of this production is actually managing to strain my nuclear reactor, so I head down and stick some more turbines on. This puts our limit up to 372 megawatts, which should last us much longer. Then again, I guess we'll see once we start putting tier 3 modules into that central beacon. We have one ingredient left before yellow science is ready, that being flying robot frames. I overbuild them, as I want to use some to bolster my logistics network, and also to produce replacement construction bots to send up to the surface, as we're willing to lose them at an increasing rate. Anyway, we finally get those yellow science assemblers down, allowing us to access some very powerful researches for us to explore next time. My final act is to demolish the old blue science setup and labs, to free up space for our new research area. Labs are probably second only to the rocket silo and how much they benefit from productivity modules, so I'd like them within range of the warp beacon, so they get more productivity, meaning more research per science pack. I set them to deconstruct, and then go up to the surface to observe our defences, whilst the bots do the hard work. As we can see by this yellow zone, the beacon covers roughly up to the end of the outward corridors, so we don't want any labs outside of that. We have the belts down for the six science packs, but we can easily add another one to include all seven. Anyway, I decided that was a good point to end off, and next time we can unlock a lot more of a tech tree, and start moving towards our victory condition, settling a planet. But for now, thank you all for watching, and have a good day. We left off last time with a proposal, that in this episode, we will finally beat this mod once and for all. I'm here to turn that proposal into a promise, and that promise into a reality. This mod has no real win condition, beyond the vanilla goal of launching a rocket, 
but I think that would be too easy for this mod. Too cheap. A certain technology, titled Warptario Homeworld, caught my eye, as it is seemingly a perfect win condition. It essentially allows you to return to the first planet you spawned on, and if that's not a perfect movie ending, I don't know what is. Plus, it takes a bit of space science to research, so we still get an excuse to launch a couple rockets. Firstly, I researched beacons and put them to work. At the end of a previous episode, when I placed down these labs, I didn't really consider the issue of throughput, that I might make too much science for these labs to consume. Up until this point, my production had been so limited I barely saw it as a possibility, but looking now, this number of labs is simply pathetic. I get lab research speed queued up, but in the meantime, I can use these beacons as a band-aid solution to speed up science consumption. Beaconed labs, that is something I've never had to do before. Another, perhaps more egregious, mistake I made last episode was the complete omission of military science. I fell into the trap throughout this playthrough of hand-feeding military science rather than automating it at every stage, but that's time I can't afford to waste at this point. I mean, I couldn't afford to waste it back then either, but only now do I have the sense to realise it. Military science is a bit of a stone hog, so I set up a stone mine preemptively to make sure we aren't running out. These lesser resources will only continue to be a pain in the ass, since they often aren't worth dedicating a whole harvester platform to, but mining them like these can be quite tedious. Something I touched on in a previous episode was how certain recipes use more of some science packs than others. Commonly, in warp technologies, each point of progress towards the technology might take two or three red and green science, whilst only using one of all the others, which is an aspect I've not seen explored in other mods. For this reason, my red and green science production should actually be at a higher production rate than the rest for when we do those researches which have that particular quirk. Now, we're coming on a ride along as I set up the harvester platforms, just so you don't forget that I'm having to do this every single time we warp. It's not just plonking the miners onto any old patch anymore, we're also clearing out the neighbourhood to make sure they survive as long as possible. At the next patch, the bite in the neighbourhood is on our copper, so we tactically displace them by firing bullets to Reduce the local land value, causing the biters to move out. No war crimes were filmed in the making of this documentary. There's still a big nest nearby, but the forest between us and them will hopefully disincentivize them from smelling us and tragically, accidentally, walking straight into a seething hot laser beam. Finally, we can place down our environmentally friendly mining platforms on the copper patch. You can tell it's green, because that's what colour we painted the turrets. Hey, hey, I've, I've seen this one, I've seen this one, this is a classic. What do you mean you've seen this? It's brand new. Sheesh, that was close. Well, I'm never going outside again. Before the attempt on my life, I was out looking for oil, but that's clearly not happening now. That's an issue I have with this mod, being that you can only pick up the planetary teleporter from the deployed side, not from the platform. Unlike harvester platforms, where you can pick them up from both the platform and the deployed side. This means, to get it back and continue our oil search, I'd have to venture back into that death trap, which... No, no, I'll, I'll live without the oil, thank you. But we don't need oil to make oil. Stupid! We can use coal, thanks to coal liquefaction, which we're researching right now. I've cleared out a little cook corner for it here, for it to watch everything else being useful for the 90% of the time that it isn't. It's not a massive amount of production, but that's fine, as this is only meant for emergencies to keep a baseline bit of oil production going. Slowly but steadily, we're working through the space science research, so to expedite the process of getting space science once it's finished, I'm going to start stockpiling rocket control units, similarly to how we've been stockpiling rocket fuel since god knows when. They are quite expensive, but with them heavily productivity moduled, and in relatively few assemblers, it hopefully shouldn't flatline our base. One thing you should never ever ever do is launch a rocket without four productivity free modules so I'd best get them producing in the meantime. Between them and the warp beacon, I predict some pretty gnarly productivity gains, 
which we'll see when we get the silo placed down. Even with those modules, it is incredibly unlikely that 7 low density structure assemblers will be enough, so we add some more in this corner. What the base could really do with is a good redesign to make the most out of all of this new space, but I've just done that and I'd rather die than do it again. With our rocket silo in pocket like the hench bastard we are, I clear out some space up here to place it down. Obviously, it needs to be within range of the warp beacon for maximum productivity. We set up the satellite assembler as well, despite us not having researched it yet, ready to start producing space science as soon as possible. I also beacon up the fuel assembler for all the difference that I'll make. What it really wants is a few more assemblers. With four productivity free modules and productivity modules in the central beacon, we get up to 62% productivity on the rocket silo. Jesus. I've never said productivity so many times in the same sentence. With this level of productivity, we only need to give it 61.7 rocket parts worth of resources to get the 100 rocket parts to make a rocket. Oh heavens, oh dearie me, oh lord, this is quite a bit of a silly situation we found ourselves in. The fish saved me only momentarily, eventually the raw damage of the worms stacks so high, even omega-3 fatty acids can't stop it. But it's, it's okay, it's alright, we have a fully stocked base, we can just get our vital equipment back and get back to work. Coal is low, so for once we're going to actually waste a harvester platform on it, since our copper buffers are actually quite full currently. No, 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 God damn you, cliffs. I, I, uh, I think that's quite enough for now. I think it's quite clear that what has just come to pass cannot be allowed to happen again. It wastes too much time and most importantly, it pisses me right off. To this end, I'm researching some new equipment to help us survive out there. Namely, we want power armor MK2, some personal laser defense and some shields. And we will also get some quality of life equipment like better robot parts and some exoskeletons. It's a long process researching and producing all of the very expensive equipment, but during that time, our space science research finishes, so we can start producing white science packs. As soon as we finish building that rocket, that is. Finally, our first rocket emerges from the silo. We need 5,000 white science packs in total, so with 36% productivity in the labs, we should only need to launch 4 rockets to reach our goal of returning to the home world. Oh wait, shit, why am I launching a rocket in an enclosed space? This thing has a roof. With our trendy and bougie rocket shaped skylight freshly installed, the first thousand white science packs flow in. Three more of those and we'll be smooth sailing. Whilst this has been happening, we've been very slowly filling up this power armor. Ultimately, what we want is two fusion reactors, seven or eight laser defenses, two or three energy shields, two exoskeletons, two robo parts, and some batteries to handle power surges. This is a setup I usually run. Sometimes swapping out lasers and shields for more exoskeletons and robo parts when I'm outside of combat. 
Here, I put the last piece in. It's time to take this baby for a spin. barring stuff for a moment. I decided against my better judgement to upgrade the surface defences, despite the fact that we're already closing in on the end, and it likely won't be any better than what we've already got. I won't bore you with the process, the new design is barely any different to the old one, but here is the finished result. Anyways, I think we have some more biters to fight.
The Warptorio homeworld research finally finishes, and our wind condition is within reach. We're going to return to that little dusty red planet from which we first departed, and bring this 40 hour voyage to an end. To do this, all we need to do is craft this little teleporter consumable, and throw it on the ground near us. Here we go. Jeez, they are everywhere. They must have been expanding the entire time we were gone. I should mention that we have another teleporter thing to get us back to the platform if we so wished, which we actually unlocked a long time ago, but it wasn't important enough for me to mention. I definitely could just teleport back to the platform, but I think a better idea would be to try to bring the platform itself here. I've unlocked the ability to aim it at a specific planet, which it has a 30% chance to obey, so I target it to our home world and set it to war. However, little did I know, when I pressed settle, it didn't set our current planet as the home world, but the planet that the platform was on. So every time we teleported it to the home world, it was just going to some random planet. Specifically, this one, which is a bit stupid of me. Thankfully, the platform has an option to target Nalvis, that being our original planet, so we haven't lost it forever. Victoriously, we return. 40 hours later, the platform touches down on the planet it initially stranded us on. And that, Ladies and gentlemen, was Warptario 2. Thank you for watching and have a good day. Special thanks to our patrons Dick Dastery Enthusiast, Larry, Marco Zafran, Rupert Van Julio, Sidney Coverman, Matthias Ferson, Deadeye, Fen Brew, Jeff Lee, Justice Wingert, Leo, LLL, JJJ, and Ryan Esdale. You guys make it possible.